Who are you? They call me Forager. Do you know someone named Orion? Orion? I am just an unworthy bug. Orion is a god who is far above us. You're too modest. You've shown courage, compassion... No, no, you don't understand. All the gods are far above us. I'm going to need a longer grapple. All right, everybody. This is, uh, man, what episode is this? Episode five? Is that right? Yeah, it must be. Episode, episode five. five uh, we're going to be reviewing issues nine and ten. Um, so it's a lot of a lot of Forager, the bug. Of the new gods. That's right. New yeah. Clear. We're not messing around with anything but the new gods right now. That's right. Um, I've actually, so in, you know, we've been talking, me and you have been talking about reading, you know, post Kirby new gods, and I've started to do that. So my mind is kind of all over the place now. <laughs> Well, you're also jumping over to Mr. Miracle and reading other Kirby stuff, so it's... Yep. Yeah, we're immersed in it. All right, but well, this is Long Boxer. I'm Jason Horn. This is my friend, Tim Callahan. Hey, everybody. So we've been discussing New Gods, and uh, we're going to get into it here. So this is issue nine, introduces an, a, an extremely different element into the story that it, it just comes out of nowhere. Like, there's no... I don't, there, I don't think there's any buildup to this. No, I guess uh, Mantis was maybe a prologue because we find out that Mantis is related to these insectoid creatures or he's one of them. But you don't know that until later in the story. Uh, and you didn't know where Mantis came from, I guess. I don't remember if there was any details in Mr. Miracle about Mantis or was he fighting? He was fighting the forever people. Yeah, he, so he shows up. So a lot of this, he's the antagonist through a lot of this. And he shows up in issue two of forever people. And that's something that I never even put together because I've never, I don't think I've ever read this issue or at least I don't remember it. I never put together that he was like, that Mantis is one of these insect people um, like, like Forager is. I, I didn't even realize that until I read this issue or I didn't remember it at any rate. Yeah, but Kirby does this thing where he kind of pulls back and shows the underbelly of New Genesis and you see these insect people foraging for food and scrounging around and you can't really tell what scale everything is like it. And I had read this issue before, but I was still paying attention to, are these supposed to be tinier than the inhabitants of New Genesis? And it seems like they are at some points because there's larger armored characters they bump into. And then you're supposed to think, okay, are they these inhuman beings? Um, because Forager, as we find out later, is wearing a mask to make him look more bug-like. Uh, but so is Mantis, and so is the Prime One, and so are these other characters they bump into. So are they all humanoid, but just wearing armor? Like, it's not really clear, and Kirby does never resolve that. Instead, he just sets up this social class uh, issue between New Genesis and the bugs who live beneath Superworld. Yeah, I was wondering that too, um, because, and we'll get into it when it happens in the issue, but like, as, as most people probably know, like, um, Forger takes his helmet off and he's human or, or at least humanoid. He's one of the new gods, um, like humanoid people. And so that seems like he is different. But like you said, a lot of these guys look like, like Mantis, like they look like people just wearing costumes. And I wondered the same thing throughout the issue. And it is, it's not clear. But the thing that's crazy, I, and it's kind of like, like a lot of things that have come up in, in new gods is very unexpected. It introduces like, you know, even the gods are racist. <laughs> Yeah. And this idea, this theme of war, I actually think this issue and the next issue are, are like maybe the two best back to back issues. I don't know that they're not necessarily my two favorite, but the story that these two issues tell, like have a connective tissue that parallels the war that's going on in the larger uh, conflict between New Genesis and Apocalypse and what Orion's going through. And then it keeps cutting back and forth between Forager's conflict and his war and Orion's like raging against the, the elements themselves. And so I think like, Kirby's really like putting things in context and he, he's exploring this notion of war and battle. And it really shows that he's not just telling a linear story at all. He's not, it's not just Orion's story, even though it is really, and Forge is a foil for Orion. It's, it's a much, much bigger tableau than we thought. And obviously we thought it was already an enormous tableau. Yeah, it's, it's it's very interesting the way the way <laughs> the 
you know, it, it, it doesn't really, it doesn't really delve deep into the, you know, this theme of like, it's, it's, I mean, it's essentially racism, like, or like a caste system of, of, you know, like you are lesser than us. And it doesn't like go deep into that. It's just kind of there on the surface a bit, but it, it's often like, it's what I think of when I think of Forager, but it, it, it but like I said, it's not, there was no like seeds of this planted. It just comes up. But yeah, it is, it is like a good two, like a two-parter essentially. Like the, uh, like the, the one, the ocean adventure, it was kind of similar. It was just like a two-parter. And I wonder if this was like, like we were uh, theorizing last time where Kirby was just like kept drawing that day. And I wonder if this is, I wonder if this is the same kind of thing. He, like, he just kept, he kept wanting to draw this character or something, or if it was more of a plan, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's hard to say. And he- he does seem to fall at least once he got going in the series uh, with issue three and beyond into these like two part stories I mean, the black racer kind of appears out of nowhere. And then his story takes kind of two issues to resolve. And then there's the whole glory boat thing, the underwater stuff, like everything. Uh, the fact that they're collected in these Baxter reprints as two issue chunks makes a lot of sense. And, and this one, maybe above all, it really has like a beginning, middle and end to this little mini saga of forager and forager's dilemma and then forager going to find orion and it culminates with him uniting with the boys and they're like a little team of heroes all of a sudden but yeah and you're right it doesn't go into the politics of any of it but it does emphasize that it's high father who's sending these almost like these uh eradicators to go wipe out the bugs to wipe out this underclass and so you see and you never see high father in the story so they don't show high father doing it but you see his emissaries conducting these these bombing runs to destroy this underclass that exists. So it it's kind of like horrifying if you think about it, but it's presented in the typical Kirby splendor. Yep, that's right. So issue nine, let's crack it open. Uh, so in the last episode, <laughs> I wanted to bring this up real quick. The last episode, I, I'm sure I wowed everything with my amazing New Gods number one. And what I was talking about, like we've been delving into post- the post Kirby stuff. I also have another new gods number one to impress everyone with. So this uh, not as impressive though, Jason. Not quite. <laughs> so out of all the post Kirby stuff that I've read so far, that is definitely the worst. <laughs> <laughs> it was not good. Um, I was actually so I did read, and we'll get into it. Um, you know, in our in a post Kirby video. But man, I was really surprised at the Gary Conway story, the the Return of the New Gods, like that. I think I, I showed you maybe off camera at one point that that story wrapped up in a, in um, adventure comics issues, I think, cause it was canceled and they just had to put it somewhere. And I have those two issues. That's all I have of that stuff. And it was good. Really? I've never, re- so I have some of the issues that follow this. The re- so the return of the new gods picks up on the numbering from this series. That's right. So there's a first issue special. And then there's all of a sudden issue 12, 13, 14, 15. I think it goes up to issue 16. But anyway, it picks up from the Kirby numbering, which is like, that's a pretty bold move (laughs) Uh, many years later to pick up the Kirby numbering and immediately like radically change the look of the series. But but it does wrap up in in a way that's not too bad. And then the Mark Evanier Paris Cullen series just goes in a whole new direction. Oh man, the bad direction. But yeah, I was, I was, I'm I'm looking forward to talking about, because it did some stuff where I was like, man, this is interesting. Like, Stuff with High Father, like High Father, the way High Father was just talking, it's just like one or two pages of High Father postulating about the mistakes he feels he that he's made with, like he, like it was literally what I was talking about, I think in the last episode, like he shed this warrior way, yet he sent his son to be the warrior. It was, and he was grappling with that. It was so good. <laughs> I can't wait to talk about it. But anyway, all right, let's get into this issue. <laughs> Back to issue nine. Yeah, so we, on this page one, we see the, the bug. And like you said, like, we don't know, we don't know what's going on. We don't know who these people are. We don't know what planet we assume, you know, we're probably on like new Genesis or whatever, but we don't know. We don't know how big they are. They say they're bugs or he's, you know, his name's bugs. So he could be small. Who knows? Right. And it talks about, uh, Kirby talks about in the caption, um, toxic micro life. And so like, to me, it seems like this is supposed to be some, some tiny, obviously like bug sized characters, but you soon learn, or at least it seems like uh, they're not. And then when you, when they encounter the other characters that have been established, you know, they're supposed to be human size, but it looks like it could be this tiny little character. 
Yeah, and he's the design on Forger is <laughs> even for Kirby, even for the new gods, it's bonkers, and I love it. It's that helmet is so weird. Not only is the helmet weird, but it also has a workable mouth because he eats right through the helmet. <laughs> you never question that stuff. But yeah, so it seems like these guys, so these guys have evolved on the planet, whereas so the new gods live in Supertown, this floating city. Right. That's like above this this beautiful like you know Garden of Eden planet, and then these guys are beneath it, and 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 in that there's like a one of those little shorts in one of the in one of the fourth world books where like I told you about like Lonar that character mm -hmm. that like he's like he's just this new god guy who's just like off on the planet um, exploring it alone because he's Lonar, um, and it seems like when in, in that setup like there's no one that lives on the surface of the planet because it seemed like crazy that this guy was here that everyone's on Supertown and didn't mention these guys but I just thought it was interesting it seems like no one lives on the surface but these guys are beneath it and then come up to steal food which is what they're doing here so this is like a little mission so you turn the page there's this amazing double page spread where they're like fighting with someone to get food and you still don't really know what's going on yet but that double page spread's amazing but even when they're fighting to get food, so there's a couple things. Presumably, they're not going all the way up to Supertown, right? Are they building a bridge all the way to the floating city, or is there some of the kind of structure on the surface of New Genesis? I can't tell, to be honest. Unclear. Uh, definitely unclear. unclear. <laughs> but, just... but some of these insectoid creatures, some of these bugs, definitely have human faces, and they're, they have this exoskeleton type of look. So right off the bat, you're like, okay, you know, who's human, who's not, what's going on. And some of them straight up look like monsters. So what is the reality of, of bug life? We don't know. I, I definitely, yeah, I, I'm very interested. But I, if, if I had to guess, I would guess they are just literally like, you know, the, the gods that, that maybe evolved underground or something as opposed to the ones that evolved above ground. I don't know. Or, or they were like subjugated. I wonder if this has been touched upon in, in the post Kirby stuff. I don't know. I know Mike Allred did like a whole book just on bug. I've, I've not, it's on my list. That's right. I've read it. No, I don't think he explores that in that series. I, I forgot that series existed. There was that period like two years ago where all of a sudden there was this Kirby connection everywhere when the Commandy series was out and the bug series. Yeah, was out. I think that, I wonder, I don't know if specifically that bug book was connected to it, but I know like that, that hundred year celebration of Kirby's birthday, that, that yeah, might've been, it might've been part of that like push to do a lot of uh, Kirby verse stuff. But yeah, so great looking I, double page spread though. It is. I think they are humans who were maybe cast out at some point and and or just you know split off like uh like the Romulans did from the Vulcans, <laughs> which you know nothing about. Yeah, that's Star Trek stuff. <laughs> so yeah, so then on, on page four we see those guys, like you were talking about, those the the monitors, these aerial monitors. So then, like, you know, if you've been paying attention, you know that, okay, we are on New Genesis. That's what's going on here. And these these aerial monitors are, like, ready to, they're, like, crop dusting <laughs> to get yeah. rid of these these bugs. A couple points about this page. They're called High Father's Deadly Monitors. So right off the bat, we know that it's definitely High Father who's the bad guy here. Um, <laughs> but that that sequence from from left to right in the top two panels, like, that's completely... Ants taking away your your picnic food. They're taking the crumbs and just you know running away um, off the picnic blanket with your crumbs. And it's that perspective that you are like a human sized thing looking at these tiny little insects grabbing these bits of food. Um, but their food, what do they call food pouches or food sacks or something? Mm -hmm. And so Kirby kind of justifies it within the reality of the world, but. It definitely looks like it was inspired by Kirby having some lunch outside and some bugs stealing away from his crumb. <laughs> and yeah, I'm wondering, so like I, I assume from this that the new gods maybe are, you know, vegetarians and they or, or whatever and, and they store their food in some sort of on the on the planet, not in the city. Right. And these guys are raiding the, some sort of storage facility for the food, which is guarded by these monitors. <laughs> it's crazy, but I, I love it. But yeah, so like these guys are spraying and not to just like, you know, deter these guys, they're spraying to kill them. So yeah. right off the bat, you're like, the gods are racist and they're murderers. <laughs> they're exterminating <laughs> this, this species, yeah. Yeah, it's just something that has not, 
at this point, like High Father, the new gods are the good guys. Like they've done nothing, like nothing morally questionable. But this is like what's like we've lost cabin pressure here. What's happening? We're the ship's going down. Like it's crazy. And again, yeah. it doesn't really get as political as it seems, but or, or it's more like or it kind of does, but it's more of a, the subtext. It's not like it's not what the story is about, really. Right. They don't dwell on the genocide, but it's here. It's here. So, yeah. So he goes back to this. It's literally like an ant mound that, that these things live in. It's called the colony, right? Well, the colony returns to the mound. Yep. Yep. And so, so he goes, he's one of the, he's one of the few that live, like he goes underwater and, and survives this, this, this extermination. And then we get back to Orion and Light Ray. And this is some of my, my favorite, this few, this weird, it's weird, this weird little bit. It's some of my favorite storytelling. And I, I reread it today with like, and it kind of changed my view of it. Um, the storytelling I like from the get go, but what they do with this woman, I, I kind of, I changed my opinion about it today. But this, the, on page six, this, this splash page of like Light Ray, like looking off into the city and Orion is like facing the audience. So he's been beaten, you know, beaten to a pulp um, previously in the, the previous issue by Calabac, his brother, and his face has been revealed to Light Ray for the first time. And, and I think Orion, so the, the majority of this issue, Orion is really grasping with who he is and and like what he what he really is because i think to this point he has he's grappled with you know these these this dual personality of of being part of apocalypse and part of uh, new genesis and he's hit it well i think or at least hit it well enough to where it's not been a huge problem for him but i think now he he really faces that and just the the the, the way he's like he's hiding like th this splash page where he's He's completely beat up and tired, and but he's not wearing his helmet. Like he's exposed and he's facing the audience, and you see how beat up he is. But and and it's just, I don't know. I, I just love the this little bit of this and and then this, so they're on, <laughs> and it also it does this thing again where they're just on a rooftop and they kind of do this thing where they peer into humanity a little bit. Mm -hmm. And what I was originally thinking was they meet this woman my original thought was like well this is as close as kirby gets to having a romantic interest but i don't think it's that at all but like so <laughs> I, it does serve it serves the function of a romantic interest it's a female foil for orion and it like in another in the hands of another creator they would have had a big embrace it would have been a whole thing about how he's learning about humanity from her even though she barely appears but you're right, Kirby doesn't go in that direction, but that's the, the role she seems to play in the storytelling structure. I think it's something else. I'll get to it in a little bit. All right. But, so she comes out and she has one of my favorite bits of dialogue in this entire series. Not good dialogue, but I like it. So, <laughs> so just complete, first of all, there was a huge battle in the city, which she knows about. And she just walks out on her balcony with these like guys and leotards. And she's just like, Hey, what's going on? And then Light Ray does this like little light show, and I don't even get what the point of that is. But like, he's, he's talking about like somehow transforming food into light energy. Like it's a whole thing about the biology of sustenance. I don't, I don't really know. Either. I don't either. I'm not really sure. But so she, but her reaction is like, you're, you, you, you guys are doing crazy stuff. So you're, you're obviously not burglars. But then this is my favorite line of dialogue of hers. Because like Ryan starts talking about like, yeah, we were the people who had that crazy fight. And she says, speaking for myself, I'm Eve Donner. I write plays that pay <laughs> for the high rent on this terrace apartment. <laughs> I, I, I literally laughed out loud when I read it. I love that line of dialogue. <laughs> I do too. Uh, especially it comes at the end of that page after the big dramatic moment. And it really undercuts Orion's pathos. <laughs> uh, and yet it's like, oh, well, now we know who she is. Because... She could have been like the sister from the glory boat story that they're returning to. She could have been anybody that we've met before, but no, completely brand new character, Eve Donner, who writes plays and has a fancy <laughs> apartment, as playwrights do. Yep. Yeah, exactly. I guess they're back in Metropolis because I don't think I don't think they go into that, but I assume that it's it's gotta be where they are. 
But right, I think he, the, the battle just ended with Calabac, right? And, yeah, you're and, right. So it has to be Metropolis. Because she says face is literally beaten to a pulp, which I think you don't see in comics. Like you just do not see heroes punch each other to the point that their faces are actually misshapen. At least you didn't see it before Kirby did this. I, I don't remember seeing it prior to this other than, I don't know, maybe the thing got beat up once in a while, but like, do you actually see a human character, a hero with their face as raw as Orion's? I don't remember seeing it. And even if you did, it certainly wouldn't continue in the next issue. Like, right. back, especially for the time, it's so crazy to have episodic connected stories in these issues for the time. It just like it was, I mean, I'm not a super big expert of like, you know, 60s and 70s comics, but like it was just not really done, right? To my knowledge. Not to the well, it was done. It was more prominent in the Marvel comics, and so it's not surprising that Kirby brought it with him to DC. Um, but yeah, that kind of moment to moment of this story is continuing, and we're picking right up from where we left off to the point that Orion's face still is not even healed at all, and his his eyes are literally swollen shut. And I mean that inking by Mike Royer on that Kirby page where Orion's face is just like totally mashed up. That shows how far we've come from the Vince Coletta inking of the misshapen Orion. It's, we really feel the suffering that he's going through. Yeah, he is on page eight. Yeah, he is. It's beautiful. Like he's hamburger, but it's and his the his caption on that on that panel. He goes, oh, yes, madam, there were monsters like he's literally. And that's what he grapples with here. Like he. I think it like took him being beat to a pulp to really deal and maybe just like Orion seeing his face to really kind of deal with it as opposed to just, and he, he kind of gets to it later, but he's usually just like, I, I'm a warrior. I want to go fight. Like he really has like, uh, like, like a, like an inner battle going on as he's like recuperating from this. Yeah. Then, in, the, in the last episode or two episodes ago, you, you wisely connected Orion to the Hulk you know, Kirby's creation of the Hulk and this duality of man. And I think we see that here. And I think Kirby's more sophisticated in his, his telling of this story, but it's, it reminds me of like a Frankenstein-like story, which is what the Hulk is. And this seems like something that a more loquacious Frankenstein would say, like the novel version rather than the movie version of Frankenstein, that he knows he's a monster and he can't do anything about it, but he's like trying to wrestle with the reality of that fact. So I do think it's a very Hulk or Jekyll and Hyde or Frankenstein like. That's right. I think I think so too. So then we get back to <laughs> all these little insect guys munching on this Cheeto or whatever they've stolen the from the energy loaves. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, energy loaves. That's what it's called. That's great. So and then it gets in so then it shows like this other insect like tries to beat up Forager. Because he's like, yeah, I'm stronger than you. And then they get into like a bit of a tussle. And then we're introduced to this new character, Prime One. And the design on this this guy is amazing. Yeah. But before we get to Prime One, that insect that's beating up on Forager and bullying him, that does not look like a humanoid. It could be. But if it's a humanoid, he's wearing a really distinctive suit of armor that makes him look completely unhuman like So... Maybe some of these guys are humanoid and maybe some of them are purely insect and maybe that's an evolutionary thing. Uh, but it also, on the next page, once we meet Prime One, it does seem like there's something special about Forager. So what is it? Is it just that he's humanoid? Is it because he looks more like the people of New Genesis? Uh, I, we never really find out. Nope. I'm, I took it, when I read it, I did, I, what I assumed was he was a baby from Supertown that they somehow came, that somehow came to them and they raised him as one of their own. That's what I, because that was my assumption too, but I'm, does it say that though? It, it does it. <laughs> it says that. So when he takes his helmet off, I mean, she, and, and this is another thing that's interesting. Like she says that he's one of the Eternals and man, they use the Eternals. So the word Eternals so many times in this issue, like I can't even believe that DC didn't like trademark it that day. Yeah. But it seems like he is from Supertown and they raised him. But yeah, it's not. But this prime one is like, <laughs> to some extent, like part of their leadership, but also has a special relationship with Forager to where like he's taught him and, and, and kind of like raised him or, or something, essentially. 
Right. So if he was raised by these bug-like creatures and he's actually a, an infant from Supertown, then that's the same story as Moses, it's the same story as Superman. So you would think Kirby would then bring that parallel into the Jimmy Olsen saga, but I, like, I don't think he ever does. I, I think it's just like that age-old tale of the orphan being raised by another culture with mysterious powers. Like That's just part of the storytelling uh, fabric here. Yep, that's right. And then, Invasion. <laughs> yeah, so, and they've got to protect the, protect the colony. So then, what do you, how do you interpret the end of page 11 when it says, protect the widow, the queen widow, which is obviously the, the queen of the hive, but it says, protect the newborn. Yeah, I assume <laughs> that they, they have babies. Y- yet again, they're not shown, and it's not really part of the story, but that's what I assumed, like, because that's the, what a colony would do, I think. Like, when a colony would be attacked, they would protect the queen and protect the babies. But there's so no assume. indication of the babies anywhere. Nope, there's not. I, but I, I assume that's what it is. But, yeah, you, they don't really talk about it. But, yeah, they just start. And I don't even, like, are they, they're not fighting. Are they fighting Mantis at this point? They're not, right? They're not fighting Mantis, but it seems like all of a sudden there are giants now. Because there's yeah. certainly at least one giant, and that's where the scale thing gets funky. Because sometimes they're fighting people of their own size, sometimes they're fighting people who are squishing them as if they're like vermin. It says uh, on page 12, Forager says, It's the armored killer species. Stop them, stop them. Who is that? <laughs> that has to be High Father and the, the people of New Genesis, right? I assume. I- I guess it has to be. It's just like, why is that guy so big, I guess? Or, I, I don't get it. The scale thing doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> it's not if they a, have these giant robots of that size, why aren't they using those against Apocalypse if, in the war? <laughs> yeah. It seems like those guys are like... In the last issue, were they, were they raiding a, Apocalypse, those, those monitor guys, or were they protecting New Genesis? I don't remember, and I don't even know if it matters, but... <laughs> I don't know. I think that was in the pact, right? I don't remember either. It was, yeah. So I was wondering if maybe they're, they, those guys, like, maybe they maybe they stay on New Genesis. That's why they don't use it. They seem, and maybe the, the oh, gas, maybe the gas doesn't work on, uh, on people on Apocalypse that they spray because those guys breathe, breathe in fumes 24-7. So these sentinels just inhabit New Genesis. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. So then, so it cuts back and like at the bottom of page 12 back to, uh, to Orion. And I, this is more of, of this, this weird situation that I love. And <laughs> so like Orion is like, you know, convalescing here. Like he's trying to, to recuperate and Light Ray does this thing he does where he like, he keeps doing it. And they're, they're, Hurry keeps putting this in, in these issues in New Gods where they're, they're either on a rooftop or they're, you know, they're watching a couple or they're talking to the Scooby gang or something where like light ray is just like pontificating or whatever, like while Orion is doing something else, like they don't, they're, they're like the, the odd couple almost at times. They work <laughs> when there's a fight, they work together well, but when there's not a fight, there's a, like, they're always doing something different and light rays usually just being weird and, and pontificating. <laughs> Yeah, well, Light Ray, is, he's more of a poet. He's, he's the Apollo character. I also want to point out, though, on page 12, that transition, because we talked about Kirby making those mid-page jumps from scene to scene. Um, and sometimes they just seem like a time-space jump, like all of a sudden we're going to be on this different planet. Here's what's going on. But in this case, it, it really does seem like a sophisticated transition. He's talking about this war and... Uh, fighting for their lives and foragers trying to survive against this monstrosity and it's got this scene of battle and then it cuts right to this tranquil scene but the caption talks about the word peace and orion has been persuaded by light ray to try it so a contrast between war and peace yet you have this character who represents war trying to be peaceful like to me when whenever someone talks about fancy transitions in comics they always talk about alan moore and they talk about watchmen and even alan moore's british stuff like, this is a pretty fancy transition, and it's certainly a fancy transition for 1972. Like, I don't yeah. remember a lot of transitions that were as sophisticated as this. Yeah, and, you know, mostly with writing. Like, it's, you know, Kirby doesn't get a lot of attention or credit for his writing, but it's mostly a transition made by writing, not visuals. Right. I mean, the visual has the contrast, but the writing bridges it in a way that's quite thoughtful. He's not, right. like, it's not just that he ran... 
there's no way that he's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna just jump to Orion all of a sudden because he, you know, he he was telling the story of a forager. So like intentionally, he stops three quarters of the way through the page and intentionally jumps to Orion. I, I just think like I think that's a really spectacular transition thematically, and it, it works for the story too. That's right, and man, he looks he's still really beautifully beat up there. And so then then it kind of transitions as opposed to just hey they're they're just getting a moment's peace on this lady's terrace. <laughs> well, you know, he's, he's doing what, what, what gods do. They just lay on a mattress on a terrace sometimes, just chilling on a mattress. But then she says, I wonder why Orion decided to stay. Perhaps I'm a challenge to him. And I think that, that she is, and I'll get into what I think that's about. So she goes to touch him, like, like almost like she's very fascinated by him. And literally goes to like touch his face on page 13 and like his crazy red eyeball <laughs> like is watching her and kind of like, you know, kind of he's kind of telling her like, you know, I'm not someone to be touched like I you don't want any part of this. And like I said, I kept thinking that that maybe this was a romantic thing, but I think it's not because it's not for I don't want to, I don't get into what I think it is until the it's not there yet. But but then oh, Orion. <laughs> Page, page 14, it, you know, if I were to buy a page of original art from New Gods, I would want a dark side page. But if there were no dark side pages available and I could somehow purchase a New Gods page of original art, page 14 is the one I would definitely want because this page is bonkers. What Orion says, his poses, everything about it is brilliant. The lettering is off the rails. Like, it's so different. It's big and bold on two panels. Like, it's barely containable when he's like shouting this stuff, literally shouting, like he goes off and then like Light Ray is just like having some soup. Like I said, like Light Ray just keeps like, like he's just like, Orion, have your little temper tantrum. I'm going to be like, sipping some soup. I'll be watching TV or sipping soup. I'm just going to be chilling. Like he's well, not. That, Orion says in the second panel, as he gets up from the mattress on the terrace, enough. This is the practice of lizards and idiots. <laughs> <laughs> so presumably he's talking about lounging. Is that the reference to lizards? Is that he's, he's lounging like a lizard because he's just hanging out on a mattress and he's done with lounging and instead he's going to start raging. And so he goes into his rage fit while Light Ray is like, yep, I'm just chilling, having some soup. My theory on that was, because I thought about it too, and I was like, lizards, what does that mean? My only theories were... A, that he was like just soaking in the sun. Yeah. And then the, B was like, you know, like lizard, was it like some animal, like lizard brain thing? I don't, I, I, but I think it's just him just laying in the sun. I think it's laying in the sun, like, like an idiot would do. I think yeah, an like idiot, idiot would lie a mattress on a terrace or a lizard. Yeah. So then That's he's just life. literally like, he's like, I can't do this anymore. I, you know, I'm not, I can't. He can't, he literally can't have a moment's peace is what he's getting at here. Right. Like he, he can't chill for two seconds because he is an animal and he is a hunter and he destroys her terrace. He throws the mattress, flips the table. Yeah. <laughs> it, so I kind of interpreted page 15, the top of the page, which it's got this really gorgeous shadow. That's the silhouette of Orion and the table and the mattress and everything is flying. I pictured him not physically throwing that stuff around, but like unleashing a tempestial fury that, I don't know, I guess we haven't seen before. So maybe he is just physically throwing a tantrum <laughs> and Kirby's trying to make it look cool by having it be the shadow. But I thought it was like he's calling upon the winds or something, uh, just the way the things are flying around the terrace. Yeah, maybe. Like he has the astro force. I don't really know what the limitations are, but but yeah, I mean, he's literally like unleashing this 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 animalistic side of himself so much so that like, you know, if you were looking at that shadow, you would think it was Calabac or something, but yeah. yeah. But yeah, Light Ray talks about like, this man is under, like, he's under the pressure of pure and total destruction. Like he is just having a crisis meltdown on this poor lady's terrace. But then it transitions, does another like mid, mid page, like panel transition back to this, uh, you know, they, they've beaten the, <laughs> the new god killers the bugs have and so then we get back into mantis so if we talk about mantis for a second like i said he debuted in um in forever people number two and in that issue 
Like he, so he came to Earth, but he came to Earth before Darkseid did, and Darkseid didn't send him there. Mantis did it on his own because he wanted to rule Earth. And the way they talk about, the way the Forever People, those kids talk about Mantis, they literally say that he is as feared as Darkseid is. Like he's not just like some apocalypse bad guy or or whatever, or maybe he's actually from New Genesis if he's one of these bug people, but he's super powerful, but he burns himself out really fast, really quickly, and has to go back into this weird little pod to like re-energize. So even if he is like as almost as powerful as Darkseid, it doesn't last long. Yeah, I don't know. So is that telling me that, I, I, I kind of knew that, but I didn't remember it, makes me think if Mantis was the first one to come to Earth, is that the parallel here? So Mantis is part of this bug a race or whatever, and he's ascended beyond that, and he's, he's like sought power. So he's risen above the normal like bug stature to ascend to like a godhood of bugs. And then he somehow finds his way to Earth. I don't know how he does, but he finds his way to Earth. And so now he's trying to rule over Earth the way he would have ruled over the bugs, but it's like a bigger deal. To rule over an entire planet than just a colony on New Genesis. Um, so that makes me think, is that how Darkseid found out about Earth? Is because Mantis already went there first. And so that creates this whole issue of the humans being like the bugs compared to the characters in the new gods. And so you get this parallel between humanity, which Orion and Lightray are looking down upon on the terrace, although they don't really show it. That would, be, that would have been maybe too on the nose if all of a sudden it cut to Orion's point of view and you see like humans walking around Metropolis just like insects. But it seems like Kirby's going for that sort of parallel with these characters. But I don't, I'm not sure Mantis's motivation makes a whole lot of sense because <laughs> now he's back trying to take over the bug people and use them for his army. But I don't know why he didn't start by doing that. I don't know why he's doing that now. I don't know why well, he... He went to Earth and and failed um, because of the Forever People, and maybe this was his like Plan B for taking over Earth because he has a boom tube. Like that's how he's getting around, I guess. He has his own boom tube, and so he maybe he went back to New Genesis to recruit these guys to finish the thing. So like Dark Side, so so Dark Side and Mantis have this little back and forth in the Forever People issue, where Dark Side's like, "You can have Earth. I don't care about ruling Earth. I'm here to get the anti life equation." Which and I and if you want to like go run around and instill fear in these people, that's great because that's that's gonna that's gonna you know someone's gonna pop up because of that. That'll, which, that'll uh, juice them up for the anti life, yeah. So so Darkseid allows Mantis to keep going, but Mantis fails and goes back into his pod. And that was the last we saw of him. He goes back into his pod, and so now it seems like it's not really gone. They don't go into it, but it seems like you know he's he's and you don't really know why he's drumming up the the bug people here until they do go to earth but it seems like that's his deal like he's doing this to finish his plan but then out of nowhere like on, on page uh where are we at 17 like forager's guy uh, the prime one who's like raised him <laughs> there's this ritual sacrifice where they're going to kill him and i right. don't really i don't they don't go into why or what it's just part of their society occasionally they kill their leader guy and it just happens to be today <laughs> Well, it seems like the prime one, so to make some kind of like godfather analogy, he's like the consigliere of the the mother, the queen. He's like the advisor. He seems like the smart guy in the hive, um, you know, playing the role of like the Merlin character to King Arthur or something like that. But apparently there's this tradition where the prime one has to die, and Forager never knew about this tradition. <laughs> and all of a sudden, like, at this moment... He's got to fulfill this tradition and the prime one seems to be resigned to his fate. And the queen mother herself is the one who's inflicting, inflicting the, the fatal blow to kill Forager's stepfather, essentially. Now, I was wondering that because they, they talk about this lady. She's the something widow. What is it? The queen the widow, right? She's the, Oh, is it queen widow? Okay, so she is the queen. That's something I was wondering about. But if it's literally queen widow, well, then she's probably I thought the queen. that's what it was, right? Isn't that the same person? I don't think it was like the... I can't remember what it was, what it was called. It's called the Protect the Queen Widow, and then they call her the All Widow. Yeah. It seems so like the she's All the Widow queen. the same as the Queen Widow? <laughs> Are there two widows? <laughs> it does seem... It would be weird to have two... But at any rate, she has like... Her armor is like gold, and she doesn't... 
and even her face does it looks it looks different she does look very different than everybody else that device that she's killing that guy with is bonkers it's like some weird spear thing it's like uh she's tapping into his skull almost yeah like she wants to get the maple syrup out of his brain <laughs> But yeah, so whatever if she's the queen or not, whatever it is. So she she kills him. And then <laughs> what's the explosion though? I don't understand. What what exploded here? Well, Prime One lives up to the obligation of his status and dies as the queen requests. So that is the queen. And I guess there's an explosion when the uh queen <laughs> widow taps into the prime one. Maybe he's some sort of being of pure energy. And if you look at uh, page 20, she's holding that tap, and the tap is is le- like it's leaching out this energy. You're it's right. Like she I sucked didn't... his energy force right into it. Like, yeah, oh, I didn't oh. notice that. I was thinking maybe whatever that weapon was, maybe that caused the explosion. But, yeah, it seems to be like a release of energy, of, or, and she's sucking his soul out or something. Yeah. That's crazy. That's something I didn't really notice. It's a weird – it's weird. <laughs> Even – for Kirby, even for this, it's really weird. Right, it's not a typical execution of any sort. You know, it's it's a lot of the execution trope. Like, here's a guy, he's chained up, and someone comes in, but instead of like cutting off his head or throwing him into a pit or any of those normal means, it's just I'm gonna tap into his brain like a spigot and suck out the energy, and now I have an energy hose that I don't think reappears. I think that's the only time we see that energy hose. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's only like, you know, it's, there's not many issues left here to, to get back to all this madness. But yeah, so that, so the, another like mid page, like transition back. It's it, this whole, it's really like a sitcom. Like it's a, a story, B story in this issue. And we get back to Orion. He's put his helmet back on. He's still like jacked up. At no point does he just do his mother box thing. And you think he would. If this was a traditional comic, like we've said, with this, like where this woman would have been the romantic interest. He, he would have like done gotten all handsome they would have kissed at the end of this but what happens is so they're getting ready to say goodbye and she's kind of like annoyed <laughs> it seems like she's get she gets a little hostile and because she she talks about so on on page 20 she says you master you 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 mr destroy it all that's a terrible <laughs> temper you've got but then she says like you'll never survive your war you're big but you're not bigger than what's eating you and and then he does something really weird like he picks her up and you think they're like going to kiss or something but it, it it gets to what i think this is all about he said he picks her up and he says um he says i will i will not uh i'm not without wits madam uh, i shall use those against him against dark side and though i pay for victory with death i shall seek you out in that final moment and then she says what's all this about which is like what i was wondering like what is all this what and then she says, like, don't tell me that kind of scene would make you happy. And then he's like, jumps, he's getting ready to, to like leave, jumps on the roof. And he says, at that moment, so like at the moment of his death. So he's like literally going to, he's saying he's going to go face dark side and will die doing it. And he says, at that moment, you'll have the choice of greeting me with scorn or a tear. And I think what he's actually, what I was, like I've been saying, I thought at first she was this romantic interest, but I think she's more of a maternal character. I think he's saying that on his death, he would be like seeking her approval or her judgment in some way. Like, so he's never known his mother. And it's, it's like this, he's looking for like, you know, any sort of like feminine approval, like some kind of maternal connection or something. That's what I think this might be about. That was my only theory, because it's not romantic. It seems romantic in the, in the physicality of it. And you can imagine somebody else writing the the captions and the word balloons for page 21 and they might have put a little bit of a romantic like promise there or even her final words on page 21 instead of i see just reacting to what light ray provided like light ray is keeping it real it's like okay I, I see um it could have been like a farewell or some kind of lamentation about him leaving but kirby's writing and drawing it so there's it's not some other writer coming in and making it into something other than he intended I agree. I think I think the maternal thing is spot on. I mean, she does have a similar haircut to Tigra, and so maybe that's enough to connect her visually with his mother. But it definitely is not romantic in any way. Even with the picking up and holding her scene, it's it's more of like 
I'm dealing with my own inner emotions and I'm going to come back and resolve this. And I think it's a, it's an Oedipal uh, mother thing going on for sure. Yeah, I, I, I think it is. Look, cause like even when she touches him, it's not, it, he just seems like overall, at least in Kirby, cause I don't know exactly what comes next for Orion as far as that goes, but he seems very asexual overall in the Kirby series. So I'm wondering if like, it, it does seem to be more of, of something like that. Like, cause you wouldn't, if it was like, if he had any kind of romantic interest, why would he be saying like, he's grappling with these things and he just wants, you know, at the moment of my death, tell me if I did good or not. That seems like a parent thing. Definitely not a romantic thing. Yeah. Agreed. So then I think it gets, here's another little thing. So Orion is waiting on top of this uh, building, not flying away. He's waiting for Orion. And then Orion says, uh, stand, stand alert, Orion. When I reach you, take hold. So Orion cannot fly. <laughs> I don't think he can. We've, re- we've discussed this. He can certainly fly in uh, the Gary Conway stuff that follows this. But yeah, no, this I agree. Series, I, I was paying attention to that here, too. I was like, yep, look at that. They make, he goes out of his way to provide some exposition to show Orion oh, can't fly. And they, they call back the astroglider, too, at some point. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. he doesn't have his astroglider. He can't find it right now. Yeah, I think he, he laments like losing his Astro Glider. He's like, man, it's, I can't remember when that is either, but he's like, I wish I had my Astro Glider. Yeah, and in the next issue, just, they put some footnotes in. Kirby could just draw the Astro Glider coming back at any moment. But he does. But he just he keeps hitching a ride with Light Ray. So, so then like he leaves and, and she says, goodbye, noble monster. Uh, it's not death or scorn or sympathy I wish for you, but only what you left unfinished here, a, a moment of peace, a time of peace. And that, again, that does, it's not like a romantic longing that she's expressing here. It's just I, it's what your mother would want for you if you were a warrior. You would want your son to have peace. So I think that's what this is. I do have to say, when we get to page 22, I'm done with Dave Lincoln. Like, I never need to see Dave Lincoln ever. Well, I, I respect Kirby. He keeps bringing Dave Lincoln back into the picture. But, like, okay, let's move on. What, what does Dave Lincoln offer this series at this point? Well, buckle up for the post-Kirby stuff because it's lousy with Dave Lincoln. Every series I've read, Dave Lincoln shows up. The Gary Conway stuff, the the Ebonier 90s stuff, Dave Lincoln. None of the rest of the Scooby gang has shown up in what I've read so far. Dave Lincoln's all over the place. No Laszlo, all Lincoln. All right. (laughs) Yeah, I'm sad. I, I'm hoping in, a, in a Walt Simons' Orion series that, that Lanza shows up and not Dave Lincoln. But, boy, you're going to get some Dave Lincoln because, like, Dave Lincoln has the anti-life equation in his head in, in some of these. And I think in both. I think in the Evanier and the Gary Conway stuff, Dave Lincoln's part of uh, the humans that have the anti-life equation in their head. But anyway, getting back to this. So, yeah, so they go back to Dave Lincoln's apartment that has a big hole in it from the fight last time, I think. And then he kind of, like, he doesn't, there's not much I think he could do about it, but Dave Lincoln kind of turns them in. He's like, sorry, guys, the cops are here. And they arrest them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess that's what you do. I don't, I don't, that, it seems like Kirby was on a roll. And then he brings Dave Lincoln and Dave Lincoln's like a wet blanket. And just like, <laughs> wah, wah. And then we cut back to Forager. Yeah. And, and so- Forager now has been given a mission by the Prime One, as the Prime One was dying, which is to find Orion. And so that's yeah. what he's trying to fight his way out to make sure he gets to wherever Orion is. Yeah, and he kind of jumps through. Uh, so Mantis like opens a boom tube and, and Forager jumps through it. And you get to see like on page 25, you get to see like the bottom of, uh, of Forager's feet and in, in his shoes. He's got these like anti-gravity tube things. Those are awesome. Like only Kirby could make like the sole of someone's foot interesting. <laughs> it is great. And he uses it later on. He uses it to climb buildings. It's, it's one of his cool features. He can stick to walls. So I was wondering about that too. Is this like some sort of shout out to Spider-Man? Like is, is Forager and Bug at all connected to Spider-Man? Because he has some Spider-Man qualities to him. And Spider-Man is the most prominent Marvel character that Kirby never really worked on. Yeah, that's interesting. That's, I, I feel like I've thought something about that before, but I didn't really, I didn't really think about that at this point. But yeah, he seems, because he's younger, he, you know, he's, he has like bug type powers. He's literally, I think when he's running up the building, it's a, yeah. it seems like in the next issue, I think it's the next issue. It's, it seems like for sure, maybe that was something he was getting at. 
yeah, so this issue ends with him going through the boom tube and coming to uh, Metropolis. And then, uh, you know, says the, the Earth, the doomed dominion is coming. So that leads us into ep to number issue 10, where we start with uh, Mantis's pod is uh, sizzling. Dude's ready to come out. So I guess like after that battle with Forger, where Forger stole his boom tube, he had to charge up again. Like I said, like Mantis burns out like a fuse really fast. Yeah, so it, the pod is like, it's like the the coffin for a vampire. I mean, that's essentially what Mantis is. He's like some kind of insectoid new god vampire, which is a pretty cool concept. He does look cool as hell. He's a cool looking character. Yeah, the costumes. Like I, I keep saying this, but it's like even for Kirby, it's crazy. It looks, it's probably the most visually, um, something that looks like it would come from Thor or something. Like it's, it's, it's very, I mean, a lot of this stuff kind of is, but he really seems like someone who would have been in Thor. Yeah, it has this ornate mask, and the, it, it, it it looks quite foreign, uh, even for a Kirby design. But it it's gorgeous. So he he's ready to take the bugs to Earth, and then Forger's getting kicked out of a pizza parlor. <laughs> hey, <laughs> stop that little thief! And he's getting. <laughs> Uh, he's getting a rolling pin thrown at him. Yep, that's great. And so then, like, he kind of has this little, you know, run through the city adventure where he's, I don't even understand what he stole. That he, he's, I guess it's like a garbage bag of, like, maybe day-old bakery leftovers or, or something. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a call back to the uh, the bread pods and the, the bag of food that he stole back in the last issue. And this is the human version of it, so it's in the garbage bag. That's really funny, but... <laughs> it's just a weird thing, but it's really funny. So then you see a lot of reaction, but then on uh, on page seven, you see that him running up the, uh, the the building and literally like it looks, it really looks like a Spider-Man situation. You're right. Yeah, that whole page, page seven, uh, looks like a Spider-Man setup. He, he's got the red and black costume, his legs on the top right-hand side of page seven. He's running up the side of a building. He's on the top of a building. And then, you know, someone's trying to catch him because... You know, Spider-Man was a, seen as a criminal in the, in the comics. I, I can't imagine that Kirby would have been unaware of the Spider-Man reference here, but maybe he was just like so in the zone. He thinks in these archetypes that are like beyond traditional superheroics. So I don't even know if there's a, a Spider-Man connection or not, but it, it looks like one to me. Yeah, it definitely look, has, the, has the visuals of it. I mean, even like in, on the next page, he's caught in a net and it's, you know, like almost like a spider web looking kind of thing. It literally looks like so I, I feel like maybe there had to be, but who knows? With Kirby, it was just like coming out at 90 miles an hour. Right. So who knows? <laughs> but, it, you know, even when you're pondering those things, don't worry, because Dave Lincoln's here to ruin the fun. Yep. And so, like, yeah. So, And this is the, the chief of police, um, I guess, is that blonde guy who, who was arguing with Turpin in the previous issue. Yep. And so they're just trying to figure out, these cops are just like, trying to figure out what to do what <laughs> what's going on with our city what are we doing there's there's little bug guys there's light ray and orion we don't know what's going on it's a huge battle we they, they're not equipped to handle this even though they're cops in metropolis and it seems like this should be another tuesday what i do like about dave lincoln as much as i'm like hey let's just get back to the the big uh, cosmic fighting stuff dave lincoln seems to act like he's the hero of his own story he acts like he's the Columbo or the Perry Mason, and he's got these enigmatic statements, and he's got like he's lighting up his his smokes and his pipe, and he's just kind of like talking back to the authority. But it's like he doesn't matter at all, man. <laughs> but he seems like he's this big tough guy in this scene. He he doesn't affect the story in a major way. He's more like set dressing. He's not as interesting as Turpin or that woman on right. the terrace. Like he doesn't have. He doesn't, he doesn't help Orion grapple with anything or deal with anything. Like, he's literally, like, throwing guns at Calabac. He doesn't really, yeah, you're right. He doesn't really do much. But that's I mean, kind it of was like, pretty cool when he enlisted Orion to be part of the Orion gang, and he made him wear a fedora, and they ran around town. But now, like, that, that phase of Orion is gone. and there's, there's no more Orion gang left. You're right. So, yeah, there, he did serve a purpose there. That made sense. But, yeah, why he's still around... It, it without that element, especially like literally, like the Scooby Gang's gone. 
Like yeah. they have disbanded. We've never seen the young guy again or the other guy or, and we barely see the lady, but like, but he's like the holdover. Yeah. It doesn't really, doesn't add up to much, but, but he's, he's, he stays around for, especially, like I said, the other guys, like they could have picked anything and they really held on to Dave Lincoln. <laughs> And then the bottom of page nine, Orion's peeping around a corner, just like Darkseid was in that famous panel that we talked about a couple episodes ago. It's a callback. Like Darkseid has now become Orion. Orion has become his father. He's the peepy Tom. Yeah. And he's, I feel like this is the only time we see him in his helmet, like beat up. Like I said, he's still not like pretty, made himself pretty or anything. I really dig that. It looks great. Um, when I showed you that action figure I have over there, it has like the beat up face and the helmeted normal nice face. There's not a helmeted beat up face. So now someone better get on that. I want to uh, customize my figure here. You'll have to customize it. <laughs> That's more sculpting than I'm, than I'm capable of. But yeah, so then Mantis is just kind of, you know, causing trouble in the city. So he opens up a boom tube, comes to Earth with this army of bug creatures, <laughs> bug people. And like I said, I don't, I don't, so the cops are like interrogating Orion and Light Ray. And they're just like, yo, Dark Side's here. He's causing trouble. There's not, leave it, leave it to us, essentially, is what they're telling the cops. But then they see, they see Forager and Orion says, ah, it's a bug. You caught your own, you caught yourself a lowly bug. And that's when, and that's the first time where you literally see like, I mean, other than the, the battles, this is the first time you see like a character you know, straight up being racist here. Yeah, Orion is not sympathetic. Not, not no, at all. He's, he's a racist jerk. I the bottom of page eleven, uh, the design of that panel always looks weird to me. The focal point being Forager Shield, like it always makes my eyes do wonky stuff. Like I have a hard time reading that panel. I don't know why. There's something about that that iconic shield and it's the way that it has a graphic on it just draws your attention. But that's like that's not the focal point of the scene. The focal point of the scene is Orion's reaction to Forager, but it, it's a weird looking composition. I mean, it's cool, but it definitely like it screws me up. Like I have a hard time parsing it sometimes. Yeah, I think it's the the coloring of having like so Orion's red and blue and Forager's red and blue, and they're kind of on top of each other and it yeah. all kind of blends together. Yeah, that's interesting. So then you see people freaking out on the streets of Metropolis in the next page because Mantis is causing trouble. So, uh, so uh, you know, as the the prime one told uh, told Forger to find Orion, so now he's finally found him because he had no idea. Like, it, he, I guess he knew that Orion was one of the Eternals. I keep using that, but uh, but he comes to Earth and finds him and warns him about Mantis. I guess, but he takes off his helmet. But like, there's no there's no reaction to be like. So we still don't have information. Like, what are these bug people? He takes off his helmet, and and Light Ray and Orion aren't like, oh, you're you're one of us. He just they just accept it. So maybe those guys are just people wearing suits. Yeah. You're right. There's no there's no acknowledgement that there's anything different about the fact that he looks like a human. So that's interesting. They're they're more shocked by the fact that Mantis is back than his revelation of what he looks like. So why does he even bother taking off his helmet? I don't, <laughs> it doesn't do anything. Maybe he thought they would take him more seriously, but yeah, I don't really, it doesn't go into that. I don't know. I mean, he says, I am one of you. So that's that whole idea that he was raised by them, even though he's from, he was raised by the bugs, even though he's from New Genesis. I don't know. Yeah. Cause when he, all right. So he takes his helmet off and then Orion says, Orion, he speaks the truth. So like, I guess he means like he is one of us. So yeah, I don't, I don't really know. I, I can't piece it all together. I would like to, it's such a minute thing and I want to understand it so bad but that's not what Kirby does. Like he does not. Well, I guess that's all you get. Like, okay, he's one of us. Boom. A single like word balloon transitioning from panel to panel. That's all we need. We get like, we all, we know what they're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Just hammer the point home. We, we feel it. We move on. Yeah. Kirby gives you what you need to, to, to get it all in. It's just like, I always want more. <laughs> I always want to know. Cause like you could just do a whole book on these ideas. He just throws away. So it's like, I want all the details, but like Kirby's like, I don't know. That's just something I drew. I don't know what that is. What are you talking about? Like, I don't even think he would think about it for the most part. Do you think Forager is that much shorter than Orion and Light Ray because he was raised by bugs or because he's <laughs> supposed to be really young? Like, is he supposed to be like 14 years old and they're adults? Like, it, 
is that supposed to represent how young he is compared to them? I couldn't quite tell. He's I don't, significantly shorter, but he's not tiny. Yeah, I don't know. Like when you saw like Isaac or Isaac or what is it? What's his name? Isaac? Isaac? Yeah. He Isaac? looks like a, he looks like yeah he looks like a little kid and and Forger maybe Forger's like a older teenager or something because he doesn't look as young as as him but then Light Ray like zaps him out of the room using his light powers and uh, you know Dave Lincoln says some more stuff but it won't be the last time we see Dave Lincoln I don't think but I don't know how old Light Ray and Orion are supposed to be either because they act like teenagers. Right, they have that kind of temperament of a teenager, Orion being the angry teenager and Light Ray being the philosophical one. Yeah, but they look like they're like thirty. I don't, so I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, it's literally like uh, when you'd watch like nine hundred two one zero or something, where it's like maybe they're, yeah. maybe they're supposed to be teenagers, but they're definitely being played by thirty year olds. So I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. So then they 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 finally face Mantis here, which, like I've said before, he's not just some dude. He's, like, super powerful. But, uh, and again, Light Ray, you know, they're, they're having a battle. It's, you know, it's not going super great, but it's Light Ray who comes up with a plan. This happens again. This is, like, consistent throughout these stories when Light Ray and, and Orion are teaming up. Light Ray does, or, or Orion does all the fisticuffs, and then Light Ray comes up with a plan. On page 15, we get, again, Orion peeping around the corner. <laughs> so I wonder, if you go back through Kirby's work, how often is that image of a hero peeping around the corner? It seems like, in my memory, it would be more common in, like, the Sergeant Fury books or the war comics. It seems like more of a war move, right? You're up against the wall, you're peeping around the corner. Or it seems like something the Thing would do in the Fantastic Four because he doesn't want to be seen. But I, like, when I think of Kirby drawings, I don't think that's a common trope. But he uses it a bunch of times in the New Gods. And it's almost, it does create this, it makes sense if he uses it more in the war comics or the monster comics than in his other superhero work, because this is a, a war monster comic, essentially. Yeah, it's funny that I never even thought about all this peeping around the corners. They essentially like jump Mantis here. Like it's not, yeah. <laughs> it's not like the glory of battle where we meet, you know, face to face. Like they straight up like get the jump on him. <laughs> Death Heck, to yeah. Mantis and Dark Side. <laughs> I like it. And then they go right at it, like fisticuffs, full page splash on page 16. Oh, that's a great image with yeah, Forager. Right. Forager's fighting his own bug people. He's fighting his own people. And Orion just going like right for the gut on Mantis. That image of Orion and Mantis, it literally looks like boxers. Like it, it, looks, it yeah. looks like not just like a normal Kirby fight. It literally looks like very realistic boxers fighting or something. It does. But yeah, so then a, a Light Ray like flies around and conveniently finds this sonic research and defel development uh, building and has this huge ray that he <laughs> uses for his uh, plan that he comes up with. That's not the first time he's done that, right? He's come back with like a Deus Ex Machina device more than once already. Yeah, I think the other time like he kind of created the device. This time he just stumbles upon it. But it, like, again, it is Metropolis. So like there's a lot of stuff going on in Metropolis. But yeah, these bugs on page 19, the bugs are literally like infesting the, the city. They're climbing all over the buildings, literally like ants on your, you know, like on your sandwich at a picnic. It's crazy. And the cops are getting overwhelmed. And you just show like High Father had his work cut out for him if he was trying to exterminate these bugs because there's like a million of them. They're literally overrunning all of Metropolis. Yeah, it's... And I'm wondering, like, how do that, like, like, we don't think of insects as being, like, intellectual. They just kind of follow the leader. And I'm wondering if that's, are they literally just doing that? Are they mindless drones who are just following Mantis because he was, like, the loudest voice or whatever? Or, or are, you know, are they more intellectual than that? It's not really explored here, but they seem just like a mindless army following this leader. Yeah, well, you know, the one that tried to steal Forger's lunch was a jerk, so they're probably all jerks. <laughs> yeah. They deserve it. Yeah, it seems like maybe maybe they're like uh, the the prime one, like maybe the the ones that are more intellectual are these leaders, but they just murder those guys. So I don't I don't know I don't know who what what the society is like for the rest of these guys, but they don't seem super smart. But they all look amazing. The design of like there's a thousand little Kirby designs on these little guys, and they all look great. This is a pretty cool sequence. This where it escalates with their 
So there was the the mano e mano fight between Calabac and Orion, you know, an issue ago or two issues ago, and now you've got like all out war on the streets of Metropolis with the insect people, and it's just Mantis versus Orion with the fate of Metropolis at stake. This is a cool sequence. This is this is like getting into that action movie territory, but it's it's better than an action movie because Kirby's drawing it. <laughs> so then, like Mantis. Is almost like they seem to be doing pretty well. Like Mantis and the bugs seem to be doing pretty well. But then a Light Ray takes that sonic beam and like shoots out a, a sound that I guess only bugs can hear. But it doesn't so it doesn't show like Forager having a negative reaction to it. But it it seems it takes out Mantis and the bugs. Well, there you go. That's because Foreigner is not of the bugs. He is superior. You're right. So, so yeah. that's why he doesn't he doesn't deserve the genocide that the other ones deserve. <laughs> I can't they believe we're resolve. rationalizing genocide in this episode. And they definitely <laughs> don't resolve any of that. Like maybe Mike Allred did that in his series, but like they don't talk about like, hey, maybe we're racist to these like this lower caste of uh, these underground dweller. We call them bugs. That doesn't seem. There's no morality. There's no none of that in this issue. And and there's only like one issue left, so I don't think we're getting to that. It's not going to be a nice tidy bow on this one. No ribbon. No, that's for later times. That was not on. That was not on Kirby's agenda. So then, Mantis opens up a boom tube, um, and and all the bugs go back, presumably to, to New Genesis, I guess, where they came from. And then I guess I guess this is the last time we'll see Mantis, at least in you know, in the Kirby stuff. I guess he goes back to his power pod. But then, you know, it leaves like you know, Light Ray, Orion, and and Forager together at the end of this issue. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Is Forger? I don't know if Forger's in the next issue. I just started reading it, but it was all Calabac so far. That's right. There's only one issue left. So the, the trio here, are they going to resolve the story or not? And the answer is they're not. Yeah, I would, <laughs> it will I would, not be would, resolved would, in the next issue uh, because the next issue for us is the Baxter issue that has extra material. So we're seeing way more than they would have seen in 1972. That's right. So I bought the the final issue. Like me and you both have been buying <laughs> like way too many issues. I bought the final issue. It was only seven bucks. So this I bought That's other stuff. Deal. I bought other stuff that's a lot more than seven bucks. But that the last issue is in good condition and uh, it was only seven dollars. So the next issue I get to read like the actual issue again, which is a big treat. But you got a few issues too. Like you got you got the first issue. That's amazing. I did. I got the first issue. I got issues one, three, and four. I had issue nine already, so I have the the bug issue, and so yeah, I'm I'm sure we'll uh, we'll both end up completing our run before this is over. Because how could we not at this point? We got the hard one out of the way. I know. I was watching. I'm watching a few different auctions. There was one auction that had every issue, like more like a reader copy. But like the the first issue looked pretty decent, but it was like I stopped looking at 170. I was like, I'm out. <laughs> yep. So yeah, I'll be piecing mine together like slowly over time. But yeah, I, I have already thought that like, nah, how many I got left now? It's not that many. <laughs> right, yeah, you might as well finish the job because they're like 20 issues or less for the uh, the earlier issues other than issue one. And then the other ones are like usually like five or 10 bucks each. Yeah. Totally worth it. Did you see uh, the Rick Veach interview at Cartoonist Kayfabe? No, not yet. Well, now's the time to get your new, new God's Back issues because he specifically gave that his recommendation. He's like, that's the comic to buy. Jack Kirby's New Gods, to him, that is like his one recommendation. And he says that's the thing he goes back to most often. That's awesome. Yeah, it's been great. It's been great reading all this. Um, I just started, like I said, I've been starting to read the post Kirby stuff. It's not great, but I'm not, I'm super interested in it. Like even, so I read the first issue of that John Byrne, um, Jack Kirby's Fourth World, and I really thought that was crazy and interesting what he did. I can't wait to talk about that. Because I've never seen anyone do what he did in that issue. Yeah, he a few times assisted. in my life, I, well, I've gone back, you know, I did all of the Legion of Superheroes stuff. I read all the Daredevil stuff for back in the day when I was writing about comics more regularly. But there is something fascinating about tracing a series or tracing ad, uh, interpretations of characters over time. And so I really am much more curious from like a historical perspective about how other creators take on the Kirby characters and then try to interpret what Kirby was doing or just do their own thing. So I'm interested from like a, almost like a, I don't know, anthropological perspective, uh, not so much a literary perspective to see how these characters are, are examined and explored because in my memory of those 
I, like, I read the Avenir stuff when I was younger. It was, like, it was dumb. That's all I remember. I don't remember it being particularly uh, engaging in any way. I, it didn't make a lot of sense. I remember Cosmic Odyssey being something that was influential and, and seeming pretty cool. Uh, or the use of the characters in the Legends miniseries that Ostrander and, and Len Wein and, and John Byrne drew that one. But yeah, I, I'm really curious in tracing their evolution from 1972 until today. Yeah, and we'll get to that. Um, we'll get to, you know, seeing how all, you know, just 11 issues inspired so much from all these creators. That'll be interesting to dive into. But the next, yeah, next episode, we've got, you know, the last the last Kirby issue and then jumping to the 80s, the uh, the, the kind of precursor to Hunger Dogs that, that Kirby does. So that'll be the next episode. Yeah, and just one final comment about these two issues. No Dark Side for two full issues. He's in the Dark next Side. one. Dark Side has rarely appeared. He he, I I would guess he's on fewer than twenty pages of issues one through ten. Yeah, which is that's it's crazy. But he's in the next issue, so that's something we got that to look yes. forward to. All right, thanks everybody for watching this. Uh, like, subscribe, that junk. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thank you to Tim. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye, everybody. See ya.